Hello, and welcome to another episode of Who Knew in the Moment, the podcast. I'm your host, Phil Friedrich, and today I'm honored to have with me Rich Devinney. Rich is an ex-military SEAL team member. He's also the author of uh, the book Attributes, and a phrase that he has used frequently that uh, really stood out to me was uh, a belief that each individual has unlimited potential, and so I'm excited uh, for him to talk about that today. So Rich, thanks for being on. Well, thanks for having me, Phil. It's a pleasure to be here. You bet. So let, let's go back to early days and growing up in Connecticut, you loved water. And so talk just about, you know, growing up in that environment, being surrounded by it and, uh, you know, how that passion starts formulating there. Yeah, gosh. Um, I mean, grew up, yeah, Connecticut right on the coast. So we were right on Long Island Sound. And um, I mean, we go to the beach every day in the summer. And so I think that just, I think when you're, when you're surrounded by that and that's your that's your thing, right? You just, you, you tend to kind of find a propensity there. And so I, I grew up loving the water, loving being in the water, everything about it. Um, and, um, and so as I, as I started to explore the SEAL teams and kind of what they were all about, this idea that these guys, these special operators would do all this crazy cool stuff, but they came from the water. It's almost like they would go go from, you know, come from it and go back to it. And I was like, oh, that's just really cool. And, um, and sure enough, I mean, I, I would say, even though SEAL training is tough, very tough, right? I, I always loved the water stuff. Yeah, I got cold once in a while, but, <laughs> but, but, uh, but this idea, I mean, you're, I was just always so comfortable, even in the pitch black, right? Um, underwater, I felt invisible, which yeah. is cool. I mean, no one can see you, no one can hear you. And, um, and uh, yeah, to this day, I just, I am, I am massively comfortable in the water. I love it. Uh, but I also recognize the, the, the ocean is not to be trifled with. I recognize the, <laughs> the power of the ocean because um, it'll kill you if you, if you don't <laughs> pay attention. So Correct. I love that. Yeah. Now, now, additionally, uh, your dad was a pilot growing up, so you got exposed to flying as well uh, in, in your younger years. So talk a little bit about just, you know, uh, that opportunity and maybe some moments that stick out to you about getting to fly with your dad. Yeah, my well, my dad, yeah, a private pilot. So he he had an he had an airplane with a partner, um, just a private, uh, single engine, um, uh, not a Cessna, but it was a, a Mooney. And so so he'd go flying on the weekends, and we go with him. And so we loved flying. And um, my twin brother and I kind of said, well, we want to we want to do this, but at the at the X level, right? And and that of course meant flying military jets, finding you know finding places now. That combined with a love of the, of the water and the ocean said, well, the Navy is the obvious place to go because you get to you get to fly off boats. And that seemed that seemed like the hardest type of flying to land on a ship seemed pretty hard. So we both were kind of bent on that um, all the way through high school. Um, it was actually kind of ending towards the end of high school when the first Gulf War happened in 1990. Mm. Um, and, uh, I remember reading an article. That's when I first learned about the seals and I was like, okay, yeah. these guys are pretty cool. But even when, <laughs> even then, you know, I went to my brother and I went to Purdue, I ended up in Navy RTC and, and it was still kind of a back and forth. Uh, should, should I be a pilot? Should I be a seal? But as I read more about the seals and kind of, you know, learned more about them, I never, I, I kind of knew I could be a pilot. I didn't, I wasn't, there was no doubt in my mind, but I, I didn't want to be a pilot and always wonder if I could be a seal. Mm, <laughs> so that's yeah. why. I chose and it just seemed like it was just so, um, I guess, hard and yeah. exclusive. And so I think that that's really what made me, you know, choose that direction. Unfortunately, I, I got selected and got to training and I made it to training. So, you know, 20 years later, <laughs> you know, and, you know, I, I, I got commissioned in 96 and spent, you know, 20, just under 21 years. I, I retired at the end of 2016. Yeah. Um, obviously a very kinetic time frame. No one could have predicted 9-11 and everything that happened. Uh, but, uh, but I'm very grateful to have had the career I did. And uh, yeah, here we are. Yeah. So I, I love how you just kind of breeze through some of those things. So let, <laughs> let, let's go right. back to your reading about, you know, uh, Navy SEALs, it's exclusive, right? Not a lot of people make it and that that becomes intriguing to you. Were there certain things that you were able to get exposed to, to uh, more, I guess, better prep yourself when heading into that training? Or was it, hey, I had kind of done my, my reading and then I just showed up and didn't exactly know what to expect? Talk a little bit about that. That's a great question because, because I talk to a lot of guys who, who want to be SEALs or are headed to SEAL training. And, yeah. um, and they're always asking that question, hey, what can I do? to prepare. And, um, and the, the miss, 
I would say it's a it's a misunderstanding. It's a misunderstanding maybe too strong of a word, but but I'll just use it for now. The misunderstanding is that it's all about physical, right? So yeah. they, they, so that most people feel, and I think most civilians who look at the SEAL teams and are very athletic think that oh, you know, I can I'm in really great shape. It's you know that's if you know I could I could do that, right? Yeah. And it really has very little to do with how <laughs> how how in shape you are because now you have to be in shape. There obviously obviously is a standard by which yes. you have to meet, but. But ultimately, SEAL training is about taking you down to zero and below. Like, I mean, we are going to break you physically. We're going to break your body um, yeah. and see where you, you see where you go from there. Break your body so you may exercise your mind. And um, and so because there's only so many pushups you can do, there's only so many miles you can run. And and it doesn't matter how how physically fit you are, you're going to be freezing in the surf zone. You know, it doesn't. You know that. In fact, a little bit of fat is better to, <laughs> to yeah. have to have in the surf zone. So so I think the um, you get there. And I had read a bunch, I had read some books and things like that, but you just, you're not prepared for what it's going to actually be, which is breaking you. Um, and I don't think, I, I think that the guys who get through are likely guys who have some, somewhere along their pathway, either in, in, in childhood or getting there or whatever, have had experiences where they've had to really dig deep mm. and, and, and gut it out. And I'm not talking about just physically because the athletes, the, 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 the 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 best athletes would often show up and they'd quit right so physical yeah. digging deep physically is a different thing than div- digging deep um mentally and kind of being in a position of where you are you are you are sub-zero in terms of you i don't know i don't know if i have anything left in me you know i don't know what yeah. this is going to look like you know and i think that's really it's one of the things i loved about so let's talk about you know let's talk about in the moment right in the yeah. moment it sucks, right? There's no, I mean, it's just really bad. Um, and so I won't say like I enjoyed SEAL training in the moment, but it's certainly after the moment, you know, you look back and I say, you know, one of the things that I think I enjoyed the most was the, um, was the idea that it was all on me. You mm-hmm. know, there was no, no one was there saying, hey, you got to pass this test. I mean, once you yeah. get there, it's hard to get there. And that's, that's on other people. You have to be selected and you have to do this. But I remember even even some of the mentors I had that helped, you know, helped with my path to get to buds. Once I got there, they're like, okay, Rich, I got nothing else for you. This is all on you. I mean, and, and I love that. It didn't matter who you were, where you come from, came from, what your grade point average was, what your financial status was. Didn't, none of that mattered anymore. It was it was all about, okay, we're resetting. All of you are at zero. Let's see yeah. what you got. And that is just, I don't know if there's there's many selection processes on this planet that are that pure um and i just i'm grateful to have been able to do it Mm, that's super good now that that brings up a question for me and that is you know you mentioned hey as it pertains to you you have a quote and it's you can't apply a known skill to how you will react in an unknown environment right and and that's super intriguing to me because you talk about you know they really break you down they deplete you and then you know you build back up but until you're out on mission right or until you're in that exact example um you you don't know exactly how you'll respond so talk a little bit about that aspect for you guys in in your you know line of work there yeah i mean this is so this is really where the attributes uh, concept came uh into my mind well i was i was i'd already been the teams for for many years and i was um running a very specialized selection and assessment for one of our very specialized SEAL teams, and this was a whole different selection assessment, nine month long, and we basically get a bunch of really kind of rock star, all star SEALs who apply, and they come to our selection, and then we basically put them through nine months, and we still get about a 50% attrition rate. And so we, we weren't in a position where we were able to effectively articulate why guys were making it through or why guys weren't making it through. Our, our, our excuses seem to be centered around skills like they couldn't shoot very well they couldn't skydive whatever it was but those didn't make sense because these guys were, were obviously skilled you know right, right. Um, and so i re- i really began to dive back deep into kind of the roots and and as i re- as i kind of thought about it you know in in, in basic seal training buds basic underwater demolition slash seal training you spend hundreds of hours running around with um big heavy boats on your head you spend hundreds of hours exercising with 300 pound telephone poles and running around with those things and freezing in the surf zone right and I, and I had, I had at that point done hundreds of combat missions overseas in Iraq and Afghanistan, and never on one did I carry a boat on my head or a 300 pound telephone pole, right? So, right. so what that told me 
was something very basic was that they weren't necessarily training us to be Navy SEALs in those moments. They were putting us into environments and doing experiences that teased out these hidden qualities to see if we if we had what it took, not if we could do the job, not if we knew how to do the job, if we could do the job, if we had what it took. Mm. And that comes down to these elemental qualities, these attributes. Um, and so so in, in kind of doing that work and then getting out of the Navy and beginning to realize and recognize that organizations, teams, individuals were, were having these conversations about these innate qualities, but they weren't, uh, they weren't able to effectively articulate that. I said, well, the work I did in, in the SEAL teams can probably help us talk about it. And that really was the impetus of the book. And so when we talk about these, these qualities, the, you know, what, what digging deep really means, it's digging deep and, and operating in stress, challenge, and uncertainty comes down to these attributes, not the skills. You can't apply a known skill to an unknown environment. This is when we lean on our attributes. And so, so that was really the impetus of the book. And that's really what got me fascinated with this stuff. Yeah. So there's a couple of things. Um, about your time, you know, still being in uh, Navy SEALs, that that's intriguing to me. And so one would just be the progression of being in your first year as a Navy SEAL, you know, being the new guy to the group, you know, how are you brought up by the other, you know, folks on the team? Because there's always a little bit of, you know, razzing with the new person, but at the same token, like in your environment, right? I mean, it, it makes and breaks based on one person and their ability. So how do you kind of formulate a team and in, in you know integrating a new person quickly? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, one, the the single word is probably humility. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, um, and again, I would say there are certainly Navy SEALs out there who are arrogant. Okay, so don't, <laughs> but for the most part, at least in my experience, um, most guys are pretty humble. And and I think the reason is because when you go through that level of tough training you are, um, I mean, the whole time you're humbled. I mean, the whole thing yeah. about it is humbling. And then you are also expected to operate and perform inside of environments that are also enormously humble, right? I mean, the, the ocean, we just talked about, the ocean is, is a very humbling environment. The ocean will kill you if, if, you, don't, if, you, if you don't pay attention. Um, you know, this, the, the, the sky, when you're skydiving, that stuff will kill you if you don't pay attention. Um, when you're in combat, a bullet fired from any weapon by any person whether it be a, a seasoned Al Qaeda guy or a nine year old Somali, you know, militant, right? Mm -hmm. That bullet will kill you, right? So, so you you are you are immediately inculcated into an environment and into a into a uh, a job where humility is paramount. And I think every new guy who succeeds, at least, there are certainly guys who have not succeeded. And usually, the reason is because they don't approach the whole pathway with with humility. And so, as a new guy, and I was an officer. Um, but even as an officer, because as an officer, you're going to be in charge of something, right? Even as a new guy, but even as a new guy officer, I, I approached everything with a humility to say, hey, listen, I have a lot to learn. I want to listen. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to hear, I want to offer, I want to be able to be confident enough to step up when I, when it's my turn to step up, because that will be expected of me, yeah. uh, but humble enough to follow when I need to follow. And if you do that, the guys who do that uh, progress into, um, and, into and through a career where they become the experts. They become the guys who can, who can then um, help the new guys. Now combat, what's interesting about combat, because some, a lot of people think SEALs are always doing stuff, right? And that's not the case. I mean, most of the time SEALs aren't doing much, right? They're just trading, getting ready. You know, they're kind of at the ready. And right. so up until 2001, the SEALs, no, no one in the military was really doing much at all. Uh, of course, 2001 happens and then everybody gets busy very quickly and the SEALs yeah. uh, in particular. And so suddenly we are working uh, a lot. Um, right. And that environment, uh, the combat environment matures you very quickly. Um, uh, gives, well, I shouldn't say matures you because maturity is really, I guess, equated to time on earth. It gives you experience very quickly. Um, yeah. and so, uh, and so those, it's almost like a, a, a I don't know, a, a convection oven <laughs> yeah. in terms of, in terms of baking experience into guys very rapidly, it's especially especially depending on what you're doing. Um, and so you use that as well, and you use that experience. Now, what that doesn't replace is the maturity, which is time on earth. So, so, so as a new guy, now I was already a SEAL for what, five, six years, five years, right? When 9-11 happened. So I was starting to get into positions where I was, I had been around a little bit, I, you know, um, but what you have to be careful of is the, is the new guy who gets into the teams and immediately goes to war. Now that guy has, 
massive experience, but not a lot of maturity. Yeah, right. <laughs> you have to be careful about that, right? Because yeah. because I think I think it's the it's I think it's experience and maturity that that, that gives you wisdom, you know. And um and so this is where uh, as leaders or as an organization, you start to have to really work together so that so that guys can gain both and benefit from both. So I don't know, a long winded answer, but you know, it's a it's a kind of a deep dive. No, that's great. Now, another thing that you kind of hit on there is just the sheer amount of preparation that goes into it. And, you know, a lot of missions and things that you're, you're sent on uh, are, are not things that you're going to encounter frequently. So the sheer amount of planning and precision has to be there. At the same token, I'm sure most of the time things don't go exactly according to plan. And right. so talk about I mean, as your time in doing missions and you reflect back on, you know, going through some of those trainings of, hey, I didn't necessarily always do this specific thing, but that preparation prepared me for the unknown, the uncertainty that was going to happen when I'm out and it is a life or death movement. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I always, I, when I, especially as I, as I got more senior and I began running training, um, I really took a, I always took a deep dive into SEALs and Navy and what we were and special operators. And I always kind of, I always kind of called us, you know, people think of Navy SEALs, especially again, the civilian world, because there's a lot of books in TV and movie, which is funny, because when I joined the teams, there were very few books about SEALs, and yeah. only like a couple of movies, you know, and, um, and uh, now, of course, there's so many. Uh, but even, you know, now people think of Navy SEALs as these master uh, shooters and skydivers, they, they think they often think of SEALs, and I would say spec ops, but certainly SEALs as like master skillsmen you know, yeah. um, in terms of shooting or diving or scuba, whatever it is. And really what SEALs are, are we are what I would call masters of uncertainty. You know, mm -hmm. we are designed to be dropped into environments of deep complexity, deep uncertainty, and then start figuring it out. Um, yeah. In the military, they call this VUCA, volatile, uncertain, ambiguous, um, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environments. And, and so the job is to drop in there and begin to figure it out. And so... Um, and so I think the, the idea is that we understand that everything is going to take a turn. Nothing is going to go as planned. Uh, so what we'll do is we will always look at, a, look at an operation. We'll plan everything that we can think of without going too far, right? We've got just kind of this 80-20 rule. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's just go through each phase. Let's plan each phase to the, to the extent to the contingencies that we can kind of work through. Make sure those are kind of inculcated in our, in our system. You know, the, the basics, you know, maybe the, 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 two, the, the three or five different things that could go wrong. We have those in our mind, have those plans set, and then we just go. And we, we recognize, hey, when things go south and sideways uh, and things don't go as planned, we will adjust. We will be able to. And you have the confidence to do that. So I think there's a, there's a balance between planning and a comfort with uncertainty mm. that allows us to 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 walk that line and and modulate that line as we go through. And I think I think I think it's a good I think um, vignette for life because we can't necessarily predict what's going to happen in the future. There's going to be things that happen that you know we we just didn't see coming. Um, we can make some plans and make sure. Hey, let's not go in there just kind of you know with with nothing you know because because yeah. because when you do that what happens is you're 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 setting yourself up for overwhelm you know mm -hmm. and if you can if you can pre-plan some contingencies here and there hey even in a, in a life plan hey here's what i think is going to happen here's a couple preparing but i'm not going to overdo it i'm not going to be paralyzed you know what's like uh paralyzation through analyzation is that i think that's how it goes uh yeah um uh you know i don't want to i don't want to paralyze myself through trying to go, analyze everything because i'm like but I'm going to make a plan so that I, I, that I decrease as much uncertainty as I can. And then I'm freeing up space for things that happen that I can't predict. And I think that's really what the secret is. That's good. Yes, that, that's so good. Yeah, paralysis by analysis, right? Yeah, right, there you go. Yeah, pause yourself from even getting started. So for you in, uh, you know, Navy SEAL train, were there any pivotal moments that really stand out to you that gave you confidence that yes, I can do this. And yes, I can do this at, at a high level. Um, um, so SEAL training is not necessarily about pivotal moments um, in terms of in terms of big ones. They're all little ones. And and I think what what SEAL training is. And I think even someone's career is a series of 
small goals that you set and you achieve. And, and it's really about, it's, it's less about saying, okay, now I know I can do this and more about saying, okay, now I know how to do this. I know, in fact, when I get into an environment that's, that's deeply complex, complex, challenging, uncertain, all that stuff, I know exactly what to do. And what to do is I'm going to chunk that environment into small bits. And I'm going to work with what I got. I'm going to control yeah. what I can control, move to that, and then do something else, and then do that. And this is a, this becomes habitual for SEALs. Um, and I think the, the it's funny, I, I, I often tell a story. I'm, I, in my neighborhood where I live, I have a SEAL that lives across the street from me. I have a SEAL that lives down the, down the road to the right-hand side and down the road a couple of houses to the left-hand side. And my wife would always say, um, you know, I, I'm really glad these guys are around because if you're not around, I can go to them and they'll act exactly like you act. And I said, what do you mean? She said, so as soon as there's a problem, as soon as something happens, you guys all just calm down. You immediately calm down and begin working the problem. And this is what you, this is what you begin to do habitually. This is what yeah. SEAL training teaches you. And of course, combat reinforces is that when something, when the environment begins to go nuts around you, you begin to calm down and say to yourself, okay, what can I control in this moment? And mm -hmm. then you start moving, you start stepping through this stuff and, and, and taking each step. And, and that's how you move through it. And I think that's really what you are prepared to do. And that's the comp and that's so, so that's what buds teaches you. Buds yeah. is literally doing that for six months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? So it hyper develops that. And that is the, the unconscious genius of that training. Cause th that's exactly what you need to do when you're in tough training. That's exactly what you need to do in combat. You need to do that. And so you begin, it becomes, becomes very automatic. So there was no, there was never any, I guess, aha moments like okay yeah. yes now i got it you're almost it's almost like you never do that because that's that's almost too arrogant you're like hey yeah i know that when the environment changes around me i will start to figure it out and it might be dirty it might be gritty it might be painful it might be ugly but i will figure it out you know and that's really true confidence i think yeah that's great so as you're thinking about you know right writing this book and you're compiling attributes of different individuals you didn't just sit there and think to yourself you took uh you know input from other folks and said hey what do you think are attributes of the people that have you know been able to have success and been able to walk in this career so talk a little bit about just the compiling of a of a whole list of you know what came to be uh the all the attributes people thought of yeah absolutely the uh the original list was what i was the the list we developed when i was running that training with yeah. the seal team um and we came up with at that point we came up with 36 attributes that we were looking for for this particular team and I, so i dusted that off and i looked at it and i said well uh, you know first of all because i hadn't matured my thought on on it for a while some of them were skills right i had to say yeah when i look at this that's more of a skill so a couple yeah. of them might you know were skills but then i said to myself well I, this is not about seals so i don't want this to be about seals so so if i were to take this list and say okay how would how would this relate to just optimal performance in general, right? Yeah. For, for just for human beings, what would that list look like? And I began to cull down that list and and then change a couple. And there were a couple of attributes that I had on the original list that weren't in fact um, elemental enough. In other words, they were uh, they were the comp they were really the they were the result or combination of attributes. Mm. So I needed to go a little bit more element elemental. And so so it so I was always writing the list kind of it morphed, if I remember correctly, it went from 36, I think down to down to 28, and then down to like 21 and up to 25. So it, so it ended, it ended up being 25. Um, yeah. And then began to so I began to, to write about those. And then they, they naturally began to also clump in these categories. So, so I have, I have five categories in the book, yeah. um, the grit attributes, the mental acuity attributes, the drive attributes, the leadership attributes, and the team ability attributes. And so and so the, the cool thing was they began to clump in these little groupings, which was really cool. Uh, it made my editor very happy because he was like, okay, now this is digestible or more digestible. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, but it was also cool because it, 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 it could put some, some wrapping around each of the groups as well. So, so that's really how the, the 25 came up. Was an, it was a, an attempt to write about people. I did not want to write a SEAL book. I never wanted yes. to write a SEAL book. There's too many SEALs book. There, there are too many SEAL books out there. I'm not saying they're, they're bad. They're, they're all, most of them are well done. But again, I didn't. I had no interest in writing about a seal book. I wanted to write a book about the reader. I wanted the reader to read the book and say, "Okay, this is about me. It's not about mm -hmm. Navy SEALs." And so, uh, and so that was my that was my goal. And and so far, the feedback I've been getting is that the that I was able to achieve that because people who read it say, "You know what? This yeah, I think about me. I think about my team when I read this book. I don't, you know, the seal. There's a couple th seal things, and that's cool. But but this is more about the reader, which is exciting." Yeah. So 
for you when you were going through selection process with just different individuals to bring in, was it a criterion checklist of, hey, they've got to meet all 36 of these, otherwise they're not going to be accepted? Or was it more so the more of these that they can check, we know the higher chance of success that they will have, but it's not going to be the you know deciding factor. Talk a little bit about how you actually implemented that with your team. Yeah, I mean, uh, the it was a little bit of both. Well, it certainly wasn't. It, it's it's fairly unrealistic to 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 ask that every person have every attribute uh, to the to the degree that we were looking. Right, I would say. Yep. When I when I wrote the book and I, I emphasize everybody has all of the attributes that it's just the difference in all of us are the degrees to which we have each so mm. I usually use adaptability as the example. Um, if 10 is high and one is low um, i'm probably level eight on adaptability, so that means when the environment changes around me outside of my control it's fairly easy for me to go with the flow and roll with it okay someone else might be a level three, which means yeah. when the same thing happens to them it's difficult for them they're still adaptable it's just difficult for them to do it. Um, and so we all have different levels of this stuff. Um, you know, again, the the there's in in the book version, the twenty in the in the attributes book, um, the idea is figure out what type of engine you have. You can be anywhere on those scales, and it's fine. When you start getting into specific roles, okay, such as Navy SEAL or certainly this specific team, um, that's when the the levels of the attributes for that role become a little bit more important, right? Yes. For this role, this is what we're looking for. We need to see we need to see levels of this for this specific role. That's right. what allows you to deselect and select people. And so and so I would say out of the 36, it was for us and at that point, it was like, okay, this is what we're looking for. Um, and I would say that you know, they're probably you could probably I get away with not having a couple of them, depending on what your job was. You know, mm -hmm. certainly officers officers we were looking for a couple different things than we were maybe enlisted. Uh, so you could get away with having a little bit lower on a couple things, but but for the most part, in that distinct role, we needed to see high levels of the stuff we were looking for, uh, because that's what the job required, you know. Yeah, well, and I want to highlight what you said there, and just in case someone missed it, everyone encompasses the the attributes, right? It's just what life experiences have you had that are going to make them more profound, or you know, a higher number for you or a lower number for you, right? Totally. And, and also it's, um, it's also, so I always, I relate it to automobiles. We're all automobiles. Okay. Yep. But we're all different ones, right? Some of yeah. us are SUVs, some of us are Jeeps, some of us are Ferraris, but, and there's no judgment because the Ferrari can do things the Jeep can't do. And the Jeep can do things the Ferrari can't do. But if you, it, it behooves us to look under our hood and see, okay, what am I running with? What's my engine mm -hmm. look like? Because you might be a Jeep that's been trying to run on a Ferrari track or vice yeah, right, versa. Right. And so, and so your levels of attributes are what they are. Um, then you say, okay, based on what I have, what, what niche am I trying to fit, right? Am I a Jeep that wants to run on a Ferrari track? If that's the case, you're going to probably have some attributes that you're naturally lower on that you want to work on to get to, to do better on a Ferrari track. Or you might say, listen, actually, I'm a Jeep and I actually, I'd be happier if I were running on a Jeep track. And then you start to find niches inside of which your attributes really fit. Now you can develop the attributes, but the idea is you don't, you don't necessarily need to have all of all of them um, there. If you find the niche inside of which you want to really excel and succeed, there are probably only one or two that you need to develop, right? Yeah. Because sometimes too much of one might be destructive to your niche. I always kind of joke that the stand up comic doesn't need a lot of empathy. OK, in fact, mm. too much empathy will probably ruin uh, the stand up comics ability to do his or her job. Well, how can, right. you, how can you find funny? At a funeral, if you have too much empathy, right? Yeah, so, right. so the so the empathy levels for certain uh, for a standard comic should be lower versus maybe a nurse, right? You want to or or I say police officers. I mean, police officers, I believe, have to have lots of empathy. Um, and so so depending on the role or depending on the niche inside of which you want to succeed or excel, you're that's going to have a requirement for different levels, and then you can just match it to that. Um, but I would say the more you can match your engine with yeah. the niche you're pursuing, the happier you're going to be um, because you're going to, there's going to be less friction there, probably less you need to work on. You know, I, there, I, I, I could never be a professional athlete. I, I, I barely do well at normal athletics, okay? Um, and so there are a lot of attributes for when it comes to athletics that I don't have, I never will have. It's probably why I never really enjoy, I mean, I, I never really enjoyed a lot of them anyway. I didn't, I'm not competitive. It's a, yeah. So that, that's just a niche I'd never really explore. And if I, if I decided one day, I mean, I'm, 
I'm 49, but I mean, if, if I decided one day, hey, I want to be a professional athlete, there's a lot of work I'd have to do <laughs> right. to, uh, to try to be at that level. If I even could get that at that level, who knows? But um, but I so I think there's a there's a there's certainly a practicability and a and a and an honest pursuit of happiness to understand what we're working with and try to find and vector ourselves into niches inside of which we can excel. Yeah. That's really good. Now, one attribute you talk about, and uh, it, it was an interesting way to, to hear it was you talked about resilience and, and you said it, it's not just the ability to get up. That That is important, right? I don't want to discount your ability to get up, but you said that the people oftentimes that have the most success in certain things are the people that can get up quicker. And yeah. so talk about that differentiator between just getting up and then the speed at which you're able to bounce back. Yeah, I would almost I would almost change that from getting up to bounce to 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 bouncing back or recovering. That's, yeah. It's really more about recovering than it is getting up, um, mm -hmm. because we can all. I mean, I mean, uh, perseverance is really more about can I get knocked down and keep on keep at it, right? I mm -hmm. just keep on going. Um, resilience is can I bounce back? Um, yeah. Can I can I can I get back to baseline? from getting hit with a challenge or even getting something really happy, uh, a successful, yeah. a big, big win or whatever. Can I get back to baseline, recover my system so that I might, I, I'm recharged and ready to go again. And so I think, I think there are people who are, who are naturally more resilient. They just, they just bounce back faster. They, they have the means or whatever. They just do it. Others it takes a little time, but resilience luckily can be practiced. You can, you could practice this stuff, but it's really, when I get knocked down get knocked off baseline or whatever, how rapidly, how efficiently can I get back to baseline? I.e., my battery's full again. I'm ready to go. Same thing with when you get something good happens. How can I get back to baseline? Because if you don't get back to baseline, you're at risk of arrogance and and complacency and things like that. So can I get back to baseline and get back on track and keep going? And so that's really the idea of resilience. Yeah. No. That was. That's really good. That's a great nugget. Now, at somewhere along the way. You meet this guy named Simon Sinek. So talk a little bit about how this introduction or, you know, uh, connection ends up happening because there's a lot of cool things that come from it. Yeah, absolutely. Simon and I, I, I when I was, when I was running training and doing this work, I started, I was just reading as much as I could. And, and yeah. I'd often read a book and I'd say, this is a great book. I need to, I need to talk to this author. And so I'd start reaching out to authors. So a lot of my author friends came from that endeavor. I'd just go reach out. Uh, now, luckily, when you're a when you're a Navy SEAL, especially at that time, and you reach out to an author, there's a little there's some incentive for that author to, <laughs> to yeah. write back. So I, I, so I don't discount the fact that I was fortunate to say, "Hey, I'm a Navy SEAL working on some training stuff. Would you like to chat?" And so I met guys like Dan Coyle, who wrote the Talent Code, guys like Stephen Kotler with the Rise of Superman. And of course, Simon was one of these guys who um, who I'd, I'd I don't even think I'd read the 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 Start with Why book at that point, but I'd certainly saw that seen the TED talk. Yeah, and I uh, I got the opportunity to to get on the phone with them, and I said, hey, do you want to come give us a give a talk to the seals? And he said, yeah, I'd love to. And so so it was like 2014 or so, and he came down to Virginia where we were and um and talked to us, and and he and I just became fast friends, and um and we just found you know our conversations were always rich and insightful, and and uh, we'd always bounce cool ideas off of each other, and uh, and so when I got out of the Navy, he. Um, he was key in introducing me to um, Bob Chapman, who's a, a, a gentleman I went to work for their leadership institute coming out of the Navy. Um, and then, of course, as I started writing the book, it was just great to bounce ideas off of him. You know, if, if I was stuck on something, usually I'd just give him a call and, and I'd say, hey, this is what I'm thinking. And he'd say, well, have you thought about this? Or, you know, this, you know that needs to be more simple or that's too much. I remember, I remember one of the best things he told me, I, 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 was, I was putting together the distinctions between attributes and skills. Like how do you distinguish an attribute skill? And I, I, I had a list of like 10 things, like, you know, 10 different distinguishers. And I remember calling him, I was like, okay, what do you think? He's like, Rich, that's way too much. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's too, it's too many things. You need to simplify that. And it's like, okay, got it. And so, but he's right because he, yeah, you know, yeah, you know, I was able to kind of think through it. It's like, what are really the key stuff and simplify? So he's he's always been a great friend. He's always been a great mentor. And um, and yeah, we still we still talk all the time. And and I love I love bouncing ideas off. And he bounces ideas off of me too, which is cool. So yeah, well, so it was very interesting because um, I was probably familiar with Simon first, and then you second 
And so I had heard him oftentimes reference different military things. And he said, you know, I, I know people in the Navy SEALs and they say, you know, the people that probably look like they have the best chance of passing this test are probably not the ones, but he goes, you know, there, there's one talk he gives and he talks about how there's these guys from the Midwest that they're not exactly physically like fit, you know, they're not the physical right, specimens, right. Um, but they're also not the most intelligent, but they're somewhere in between and they got like the work ethic attribute or you right, know, right. Like, that idea. And then to hear you talk, I'm like, wow, I think that that might be where he was getting it from. Was it was our guy rich here? It totally was. And, and I think it was fun for, as I wrote the attributes, it was fun for us to talk because he, I was, I was starting to talk about those intangibles that he mentions. What are those intangibles? So, so we've we've had a good time because he's so good at talking about um, leadership and and business and teams and um, and when we began our conversation around trust and performance and what are those innate qualities, uh, those soft skills. That's where our we've really found our content kind of intersects and and we've really had a good time uh, with that because uh, because it really does and 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 it's one of the co coolest things about our about our friendship and certainly the content we can actually bring to people, which is fun. Yeah. So along the lines of trust, it, it's an interesting topic. And, you know, Simon has said this, I'm sure you've heard it. He says things along the lines of, you know, it takes longer than seven days. It takes less than seven years. Right. Uh, but it's somewhere in between and you can't necessarily pinpoint the moment. So inside of, you know, what you're asking people to do, right, is become a part of a cohesive unit and, to your point, we don't know how long you're going to have to become this cohesive unit before we're going to need you. So is there that innate trust because you know what someone has had to go through to get that opportunity? Or is there still that trust building between the team that that just takes time like any other function of a team? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And Simon, and I actually have debated that uh, that question <laughs> because I have I, I've and, and I actually I, I would say this and he's, he's probably he, he I know he would agree with me when I say that, but um, but it, it can it can actually it doesn't take longer. It might not necessarily take longer than seven days. You can establish trust almost instantly. I think it depends on intensity of experience. Yeah. Um, you can go through a very intense experience with another human being and generate trust almost immediately. Right? Think about <laughs> right. think about if you're a motorist or say just give an example. You and I are are cycling along yeah. this along the road we get hit by a car or something okay we're laying on the road almost dying and someone pulls over and begins to help us okay mm. immediately we start i mean we, we and then it takes us and whatever does gets emergency service we yeah. have built trust with that person immediately okay yep. and we and that trust lasts a little bit too depending on yeah you know, so so you can build uh you can trust can happen fairly quickly um now the long long term trust the, the trust that lasts years and years and years that stuff takes time a little bit more time to develop because because the, the likelihood is in that situation where we just got cared for by this human being we're likely going to maintain a, 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 a relationship with this human being and we're going to build deeper and deeper trust over the years right um but trust relationships can happen fairly quickly um it's really the it's really the kind of the forging and the 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 longevity and the durability that starts taking time and again, that time is TBD, you know, it yeah, doesn't right. matter. But I do think um, intensity of experience also accelerates all that stuff. I mean, and this is probably what the genius of SEAL training is. Um, right. And certainly what combat allows you to do. Um, it, it, it puts you in very intense environments inside of which you build trust fairly rapidly. And by the way, build build distrust fairly, fairly rapidly. Both, it, it happens both ways. Correct. You can, you can not trust someone as fast as you can trust them based on based on the intensity of that environment. So um, so I think that's the key. And that's why um, if we think about those people that we trust so much and the most in our lives, it's likely that a lot of them have been with us and around us during very intense experiences. Um, and so I think that that is a factor that we have to take into consideration. That is something I'm going to ponder very deeply. I think there's I think there's a lot of work that can be done there. I love that. Yeah. So so Rich, for you, you know, once again, you re retire military and you get, you have connections and you have opportunities to start doing speaking and coaching. So talk a little bit about just, you know, what you're doing there and what really what your mission is. And I mean, you're obviously passionate about it as we've been hearing throughout our conversation. Yeah. Well, so, so yeah, I do, I do, I do speak uh, talks. I give speeches yeah. and talks about the content um, and I do a couple uh, do smaller workshops here and there. Um, we we're, we're really starting to do a lot more consulting with businesses yeah. and teams about, and we, we go into businesses, we help them 
figure out uh, what attributes that they require for both their business and their sp specific positions? Because you have yeah. your overall business that you have specific attributes you want each employee to embody. That list is usually small. It's one or two things. But then what, what does each position look like? We can we help businesses understand, okay, at, for this position, instead of just looking at skills, yeah. what are the attributes you're looking at? And once you get that mapped out, then you can start saying, okay, now how do I, uh, how do I set up training and development? So I'm not just training skills, I'm actually helping develop attributes. That, and then that, that begins to change your, your training environment. But then also it tells you exactly where your gaps are and say, okay, we're actually missing some of these attributes. How do we hire specifically for these attributes? Because hiring for attributes is also something that has to be taken into account and yeah. done quite deliberately. Because again, it's very easy for someone to sit down in, in, a, in an interview, show you a resume and talk about skills and yes. be whoever you want them to be for whatever long that interview period is. Um, looking for attributes takes a lot more, takes, takes more depth, a little bit of uncertainty, a little bit of challenge. And so we go into companies and do that. And then and then this year, we're actually going to start building into um, content for uh, kids and educational environments. We really, I mean, ultimately, you know, if we can get, uh, if we can, we can start helping kids with this stuff. Um, and again, with kids, it's not about telling them who they are or providing them labels. You know, you are not very adaptable type stuff. Mm. It's really, it's really helping them develop habits of introspection. Yeah. Uh, because that's really a true superpower. Anybody who develops a habit of consistently introspecting, looking into themselves, understanding who they are, where their gaps are, what, what they want to work on. That's the key to success, I think, um, because you're constantly improving. You're constantly uh, allowing yourself to be humble. You're constantly seeing where you, where you could do better. Uh, and that's really, the, the attributes is a way we can help kids with that discussion and saying, hey, listen, you can, you can, you can explore your adaptability by doing some cool, you know, try this and try that and give, give, give people options, give, give younger folks some options and some permission to go explore some things that they may not know about themselves just yet. I love the mission of doing that with, yeah, youth. That's huge. Now, something that I was thinking about before, uh, as you were talking about, you know, working with different uh, companies and uh, things of that nature, would you say that the differentiator on the ability to figure out attributes is the questions or are you helping companies maybe even put together like obviously not not intense like navy seal scenarios yeah. but you know like different scenarios and uh you know things to walk through opposed to just a formal interview question answer process yeah we're we're actually doing that we're helping companies figure out these experiential environments as well uh, because experience is, is probably the best gauge yeah. you know, i mean you can you can ask some tougher questions but questions typically are, are not going to be necessarily as as uh, visceral um, yeah. inside of which you can really explore attributes. So it's so it's experience, it's a little bit of time and things like that. But yeah, we're working with companies to do that as well. That's another thing we're going to build out and and do do more and do better. But again, it becomes a little bit more subjective for the team for the company. Obviously, I can't take a group of prospective accountants to the to the beaches of San Diego and throw them in the surf and do surf torture like <laughs> right. you do Navy SEALs. It's not going to tell me much about whether or not they're going to be good accountants, right? Correct. Um, so you have to be contextual with these environments you create inside of the uh, the niche you're trying to kind of look for. Um, because again, you throw me into a tough, uh, you know, challenging accountant environment, and I'm going to look like a, a, a doofus, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to fail miserably because it's, I'm not designed that way. Yeah. Uh, so you have to be contextual. You have to be careful. Um, one of the things I see a lot of, you know, there's a lot of guys out there and they, they put businesses through these experiences um, and teams to these, these really tough experiences. And that's cool. It, it creates some bonding and some grit and things like that. Um, but if you're, not, if you're not indexing that with what you're actually trying to accomplish, it's very, it's very hard to extract that and say, okay, how am I going to use this in everyday life? And I'm really interested in how we take these lessons and make them ubiquitous. How do we apply them to everyday life? Because, because if I can't do that, and there's, I mean, there's no point in, in talking about it. Then it's just me telling some seal stories. And it's just, it's actually me putting myself on a pedestal, which I have no interest in doing. I want to, I want to do it, talk about it in a way so, so people can listen to that and put themselves on the pedestal and explore their own, their own potential. That's really good. So there's two last things I've got. One is uh, you brought up the idea of peak performance versus optimal performance. And, you know, peak performance is the buzzword, the cliche, you know, that everyone's talking about. So talk a little bit about your differentiator and then why focusing on optimal performance is a better idea for most people. 
Yeah, peak is an apex. That's all yeah. it is. Everybody's chasing peak, but we have to understand peak is an apex, and you can't go anywhere but down when you're at the apex. <laughs> that's, that's the only place you can go. And so, you know, it's so we I talk about optimal performance because that's really what special operators are. We're optimal performance. So we in optimal performance is how can I do the very best that I can in the moment, whatever the best looks like in that moment. So certainly sometimes the best looks like peak. It looks like, you know, everything's clicking, your it's flow states and all that stuff. Sometimes our best though, it's like I am head down grinding it out, going step by step because that's all I got. And it's dirty, it's ugly, it's painful, but that's all I got. Uh, yeah. and that is also optimal performance. And so it allows us to give ourselves permission to celebrate both polarities. Yeah, sure, it's great when things are growing great, but if I'm just, even when things are going really bad, if I'm just moving, if I'm just going, am I taking step by step, that's awesome too, that's optimal performance. So it allows you to do that. It allows you to manage your energy in a more responsible way. I don't need to be peak when I'm driving to the grocery store. I can be, <laughs> I can be recovering at that moment, right? You, can, you yeah. can pick your moments to peak and then recover moments. And you know, and, and start to understand how to optimize that energy throughout a day, throughout a week, throughout a, throughout years. And that, that's the idea behind optimal versus peak. Yeah, that's really good. So uh, rewind that, listen to that on loop for a little bit. That, that's good. Now, the, the last thing then, Rich, that I, you know, I'm just always interested by is when you've lived as long as you lived in a military environment, right? And a, I mean, everything that comes with that transitioning into every day, you know, being with ordinary civilians, it that has to be quite the process to get into different mindsets and to adjust, you know, interactions and maybe even what you expect from other people. Um, but talk a little bit about that for you. Well, that is uh, what I've always I've been trying to do for years, and that's develop my empathy. Um, yeah. I mean, it's you, you need empathy to, to to try to feel how other people feel and take yourself out of the equation. Try to put aside all of your biases and preconceived notions and all that stuff, and say, okay, how can I feel how this person feels? And so it's been a great exercise for me in getting into the shoes of other people and understanding where they're coming from. Um, yeah. And and really, I mean, the work we do on stress and and uh, challenge and things like that, it it's, it's, it's makes it easier to understand because stress is a physiological response, right? And so, so contextually, it can be different, you know, right? but physiologically, it's the same, which means that the stress that I might feel in a gunfight in Iraq um, might be exactly the same, if not less, than the stress some business person might feel before they're about to give a presentation, physiologically, right? Yep. Um, because I might be used to the gunfight, right? So my stress right. might be low, you know? Right. Um, this person might be like completely like freaking out um, yes. and there's no judgment in the context. Um, it's all physiology. And so, so when you start thinking it from a physiological standpoint, you start being able to relate that and saying, okay, I get it. You know, just because it, the contexts are different doesn't make anything better or worse, but I can now get into the shoes of that person and perhaps help them. Wow. Fire. It's awesome. <laughs> Rich, I want to thank you so much for your time today. I mean, I, I love just your story from, you know, growing up in the water to then, you know, pursuing a career as the, you know, elite in the water in the Navy SEALs. Now taking all those things you've learned and helping, I mean, hundreds and thousands of people and uh, it'll be millions uh, as you just continue to grow. But I want to thank you for your time and uh, look forward to staying connected and uh, doing this again, you know, after book number two and that's done. <laughs> That sounds great, Phil. I appreciate being here. Uh, you know, great talking to you. And yeah, I definitely want to stay connected and um, and we'll keep we'll keep our conversations going. Thanks again.